Hi everyone, this video is part two of the 3B series on learning in the unit three content for AP psychology students. This particular video will focus on the applications of classical conditioning. Now, as you can see on the unit outline, we are in the second part of the unit three content, and I'm calling this section part B. Part B focuses specifically on concepts related to learning. And as you can see, classical conditioning is listed first, and this is actually the second part of two videos on classical conditioning. In this video, I will cover the following key focus questions. By the end of the video, you should be able to answer all of them. Here are a list of concepts that I will be explaining in today's video. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. In the previous video in this series, you learned about the components of classical conditioning through the study of Ivan Pavlov. You learned about the unconditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response, as well as the conditioned stimulus and the conditioned response. And you also learned how organisms can develop involuntary behaviors like a reflex to a completely neutral stimulus. And you might be wondering, why does this even matter? And is this something that is even relevant today? And the answer is classical conditioning applies to so much more than salivating dogs. Many other responses to many other stimuli have been classically conditioned in all kinds of different organisms. In fact, every species tested from microscopic creatures to earthworms, to fish, to dogs, to monkeys, to people have been able to show that responses like reflexes can be classically conditioned. So we can produce a conditioned response to a once neutral stimulus. So classical conditioning is one way that virtually all organisms can learn to adapt to their environment. And it's really important to know that Ivan Pavlov demonstrated that learning could be studied objectively through visible and measurable changes in behavior. With that said, today's video will focus on additional research that has built upon Ivan Pavlov's discovery of classical conditioning, as well as how we can apply these findings to the real world. So building on Ivan Pavlov's work, behavioral psychologist John B. Watson and his research assistant, Rosalie Rayner, studied classical conditioning using a nine-month-old human subject called Little Albert. This 1920s study was groundbreaking in behavioral psychology because it demonstrated how emotional responses could be classically conditioned in humans. They began the study by determining little Albert's baseline or his natural reaction to a white laboratory rat. As you can see on the screen, little Albert showed no distress. He watched the rat with curiosity, but displayed no emotional reaction. To test whether they could create an involuntary fear response to the sight of a white rat, they startled little Albert with a loud noise by striking a metal bar out of sight while showing him a rat. And it was clear that the noise startled little Albert because he showed physical signs of distress and began to cry. Over several sessions, the researchers repeated this pairing of the rat with the loud noise, and each time Albert became increasingly upset. Eventually, Albert began to show signs of fear, such as crying and trying to move away at the, at the sight of that rat. And even when the noise was not paired with the rat, little Albert showed those signs of physical distress. These behaviors demonstrated that Albert had learned to associate the rat with the loud noise, and then he began to produce that involuntary startle response when seeing the rat. So now let's practice some of the concepts you learned in the previous video about components of classical conditioning. I'd like you to take a moment and pause the video to determine the unconditioned stimulus, the unconditioned response, the conditioned stimulus, and the conditioned response in this particular study. When you're ready, hit play and you'll be able to see the answers. So hopefully you remember that something that is unconditioned is untrained, or it's not something that needed to be learned, it's something that happens naturally. So the unconditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response occurs naturally. It does not have to be learned. So the unconditioned stimulus is the object, the loud noise that naturally causes the unconditioned response, which is that startle behavior of crying and flinching. Now, naturally, little Albert was startled by that noise but when that noise, that loud noise was paired with the rat, he started to develop a new learned behavior. So the white rat became the conditioned stimulus and he learned to startle or cry at the sight of the white rat. And this became the conditioned response. 
In their study, Watson and Rayner were able to demonstrate two important concepts. They are stimulus discrimination and stimulus generalization. Let's start with stimulus generalization. This is when after conditioning has occurred, the subject produces the conditioned response to objects that are similar to the conditioned stimulus. Watson and Rayner introduced little Albert to other objects that resembled the white rat to see if his conditioned fear extended beyond just the white rat. These objects included a rabbit, a dog, a seal skin coat, and a Santa Claus mask with a fuzzy white beard. Although Albert had not been exposed to these items during the conditioning process, he showed a similar fear response to them after he had been conditioned to fear the white rat. When he was presented with the rabbit, the furry coat, and the bearded mask, he demonstrated the same fear response that he showed when he was presented with the white rat. And this reaction occurred because the objects shared similar characteristics, particularly their soft texture or their white furry appearance. Watson and Rain concluded that Albert's conditioned response to fear the white rat had been generalized to other stimuli that were similar in appearance. This is a classic example of how a conditioned response can transfer to related objects or situations, and this is called stimulus generalization. Now, stimulus discrimination is the opposite of stimulus generalization. Had little Albert been presented with a toy truck and a ball, he likely would have been able to identify the difference that the toy truck is not like the rat and the ball is also not like the rat. There's a difference between these objects and the conditioned stimulus. Neither are furry and they don't share similar characteristics. So little Albert would likely not show any kind of fear response to these objects. He would have what is called stimulus discrimination because he could tell the difference between them and he would not produce the conditioned response when presented with these objects. It's important to note that stimulus generalization and stimulus discrimination will come up again in the section related to operant conditioning. But in classical conditioning, when we talk about stimulus discrimination, this is the ability do, to distinguish the difference between the conditioned stimulus like the rat and other objects that have not been associated with the conditioned stimulus. Now, Watson and Rayner's research has demonstrated that emotional responses can be classically conditioned. This means that an individual can be trained to produce an emotional reaction to a neutral stimulus. Albert was conditioned to fear, but this can also be used in a positive and productive manner, one in which someone can be conditioned to produce a positive or desired behavior. And this has been seen useful in therapeutic settings. There's a technique called counter conditioning that's used in behavioral therapy, and it draws on classical conditioning to produce a more desired response. Counter conditioning involves pairing a feared stimulus with something positive to produce a relaxing response that will replace an unwanted emotional reaction. And over time, the negative emotional response of fear is replaced by this more positive or more neutral response. Behavioral psychologist Mary Cover Jones worked in 1924 to try to understand this part of classical conditioning. And she used what is called counter conditioning to show that it can treat psychological distress. She worked with a young boy named Peter who had a fear of rabbits, which caused him distress. Jones used a technique where she gradually exposed Peter to the rabbit while simultaneously presented him with something pleasant. And in this case, it was his favorite snack milk and crackers. And initially the rabbit was kept at a distance and over time Peter's fear began to decrease as he associated the presence of the rabbit with his enjoyable experience of eating his favorite snacks. And eventually the rabbit was brought closer and closer to him and Peter was able to calmly interact with the rabbit without feeling fear. And this success in her study provided strong evidence for counter conditioning, showing that a feared stimulus like the rabbit could be paired with some Something positive like eating the snacks to produce a um, more desired response. And this demonstrated how emotional responses can be unlearned through um, conditioning and could be replaced with new associations. Mary Cover Jones is credited as the mother of the behavioral therapy for her use of counter conditioning as a therapeutic technique for treating phobias and anxiety disorders. Another important aspect of classical conditioning that you should be aware of is something called higher order conditioning, 
or also called second order conditioning. Let me go back to the first example and use it to demonstrate higher order conditioning. In Watson's study of little Albert, he paired the loud sound with the white rat and he conditioned Albert to have a fear response to furry white objects. Higher order conditioning would occur if the previously conditioned stimulus the furry white rat was paired with a neutral stimulus, such as a light flickering. So if the rat is paired with the light flickering, now Albert might show a fear response to the light flickering. And this would be the second conditioned stimulus. And this would be considered second order conditioning or higher order conditioning. Let me give you a real world example. Suppose a child is classically conditioned to fear dogs because the child was bitten by a dog. This would be the unconditioned stimulus, which causes fear, which would be the unconditioned response. So the dog bite causes fear naturally. Now, over time, the child might develop a, a response to other dogs. So when seeing dogs, they might associate that experience with dogs. And now the child might fear dogs. So because the dog was present, now all dogs are starting to create this fear response. So that would be the first set of conditioning. Now, if the child starts to fear places where dogs are commonly seen, like a park, this would be the second conditioned stimulus or higher order conditioning because the park was paired with the dog, which was the initial con conditioned stimulus. But the fear of dogs originated from the unconditioned stimulus, which was being bitten that first original dog bite. And this would be higher order conditioning when the conditioned stimulus is paired with a neutral stimulus. And now there is a second conditioned stimulus. Another important real world application of classical conditioning is something called taste aversions. Taste aversion is when you have a learned avoidance of a specific food or drink after it's been associated with nausea, illness, or discomfort. So an example of this would be if someone gets sick after eating a certain food, they might develop a strong dislike for that food, even if the food itself didn't directly cause the illness. Research on taste aversions, which are acquired through classical conditioning, demonstrate both one trial learning and biological prepare preparedness. One trial learning occurs when an association is formed after a single pairing of the stimuli, like the taste and the illness, without needing additional pairings to strengthen the connection. For example, in the research conducted by John Garcia and Robert Kelling, rats learn to avoid a specific taste after only one exposure to it being paired with an illness that was caused by radiation. Rats were given a specific flavor and then were given a dose of radiation, which made them feel sick. And this only needed one pairing. And after this one encounter, the rats avoided that specific flavor altogether. This is referred to as one trial learning. It is quick and it doesn't require repeated pairings to solidify the response. You might relate to this example because humans can experience this one trial learning with food and nausea. If you've ever eaten a certain type of food and then gotten sick, you might want to avoid that food in the future because of the sight or the smell of it is making you nauseous and you've associated that particular food or drink with sickness. And that's what's called a taste aversion. Something else that's really important here is something called biological preparedness, which was something that Garcia and Kelling identified in their study with rats and illness. Biological preparedness refers to how animals, including humans, are biologically predisposed to learn to pick up certain associations more easily than others due to evolutionary factors that enhance survival. Researchers paired other stimuli with radiation, um, things other than just taste, and the rats would, wanting to see if the rats would also develop this food aversion, and they realized that sights and sounds when paired with that radiation did not create that same quick food aversion that when that flavor was paired with the radiation. And this is believed to be because of a predisposition to certain stimuli and certain response pairings, such as illness and taste, which supports the idea that organisms are naturally equipped to learn some associations more quickly than others, ones that will be more helpful in their survival.
Now there's one final note in the CED regarding classical conditioning, and it's in reference to a term called habituation. Now habituation is not an element of classical conditioning. It's a form of learning and it's similar in that it does require repeated exposure to a stimulus over time, but habituation is when an organism stops reacting to something after seeing or hearing or experiencing it many times over and over again. This happens when the stimulus stays the same and doesn't cause any new or important change. Now, you might be thinking this sounds really similar to a term from unit one called sensory adaptation, and you would be right. It is similar, but it's not the same. Sensory adaptation happens in our sensory organs like our nose or our skin, and we just stop detecting a stimuli after constant exposure while habituation happens in our brain. And this happens when something occurs repeatedly, like a car alarm going off for hours in the parking lot, your brain will just learn to ignore it. You won't react as strongly to it as maybe the first time you heard the honking, but it's not that you don't hear it anymore, you just start to ignore it. A classic study demonstrating habituation was conducted by Robert Dishman in 1965, where he observed how newborn infants reacted to a repeated visual stimulus, such as a moving light. At first, the infants would show interest, like they would look at the moving light, but after repeated presentations, their attention decreased significantly, indicating habituation had occurred. This showed how the infants could adapt to the repetitive stimulus by becoming less responsive to it over time. This is referred to as habituation when organisms grow accustomed to and exhibit diminished response to a repeated or enduring stimulus. So let's finish today's video with a few questions for review. Remember, I'll read you the question and you'll need to pause to determine the answer. Question number one says, which of the following is a reason Pavlov's work remains so important today? Question number two says, which of the following is an example of a taste aversion? Question number three says, Courtney is the supervisor of all the cashiers at a local grocery store. When cashiers have questions, they flip on a light to signal court to Courtney to come assist them. Initially, Courtney walked quickly immediately upon seeing the lights flash at the grocery store. Now, after seeing hundreds of lights flash over the course of a week, Courtney finds that she does not walk as quickly over to the cashiers when she sees a light. This is an example of... This concludes today's video lesson on the applications of classical conditioning. On the left-hand side of the screen are the answers to the multiple choice review questions. And on the right-hand side of the screen are the key focus questions and the vocabulary concepts covered in the video. Before finishing up, take a moment to check your understanding of the elements of today's video.